Welcome to the Rerooted Podcast with Francesca Maxime, trauma-sensitive mindfulness meditation teacher and poet. Together, we'll take a closer look at approaches to transforming trauma with insights from psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. Join Francesca and her guests for an exploration of our shared connection and how we can cultivate greater compassion for ourselves and for others. If you'd like to support Francesca and the Rerooted Podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Francesca. Hi, everyone. I'm Francesca Maxime, and thank you so much for joining us for this edition of the Rerooted Podcast on the Be Here Now Network. Um, it is the 13th of June uh, as we are recording this, and I am here with a couple of very special guests that I'm so happy to have join us. Um, first one is Father Greg Snyder. He is a priest and Zen Buddhist Dharma teacher at the Brooklyn Zen Center, and he's also the senior director and assistant professor of Buddhist studies at Union Theological Seminary uh, here in Manhattan in New York City. And we're also joined by senior Zen student uh, at the Brooklyn Zen Center, Joseph Gibson, who's also a Dharma teacher trainee, a Dharma teacher trainee with the Insight Meditation Society, which is a four-year training program, I believe, and um, really grateful to have them both here today to talk about some of the work that they're doing at the Brooklyn Zen Center uh, around undoing patriarchy and uh, oppression. And the group that they have here that we're going to sort of discuss a little bit and about what they're unpacking in this group um, is this monthly group of Zen practitioners who identify or identified as male coming together to explore the construct of patriarchy, its impact on our lives, our communities, and to work toward developing our sacred masculine identities. Just pausing there for a moment. Our sacred masculine identities. Those dynamic and restorative aspects of masculinity that strengthen our ability to cultivate wisdom, compassion, and community. And in the group, they contemplate what the cost of patriarchy has been for the lives of everyone along the gender spectrum. How does patriarchy obstruct the expression of a sacred masculine identity? Could the expression of a sacred masculine identity lie at the very heart of undoing the violence of patriarchy in our sanghas, our group gatherings as Zen practitioners or as any kind of um, mindfulness practitioner really in communities. And I just wanna welcome you both. Thank you so much for being here with us on Rerooted. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So now that we've gotten that all out of the way, <laughs> talk to me, brothers, what's happening? Um, no, really, it's a beautiful thing to be able to discuss this with folks who are actually doing the work and kind of unpacking all of the different levels um, that, it, that it brings. Um, and so I think maybe the discussion today can be sort of multi-layered, and I'm sure it'll go in a million directions, but um, sort of what is, the, what is patriarchy as sort of the template uh, for oppression or of oppression um, mm -hmm. that we often see, and, and how does that play out in all the other isms? Um, how boys as children are cut off from, from the ways uh, of sort of being more maybe intimate or vulnerable or things that might be inherently um, things that could sort of disrupt patriarchy. Um, what are the ways in which we have internalized uh, patriarchy? And you speaking as, 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 as men here um, around this, as opposed to, to me speaking in this way. Um, and then also kind of taking some responsibility or checking into what's happening with things like Me Too and how patriarchy plays out and how um, as embodied beings, there's this um, way of relating that gets interrupted perhaps with female bodies or female identified bodies um, because of or through patriarchy, if that sounds okay. And I'll let you guys open it up and whoever wants to start can begin and go for it. That's big. Um, let's <laughs> see, uh, a few, I'll just say a few things about, um, and then open up for Josen, but um, a few things about how how patriarchy becomes a model. And really anytime we're talking about power and domination, which I think is what, um, what patriarchy set the template for and all the other forms that, that it expresses, its, that domination expresses itself. But if we think about it, when we're young, right, all of us learn roles. And we learn all kinds of roles. Most of those roles are fluid. 
but um, there are a certain number of roles when it comes to uh, our patriarchal identity or races or the way racialization happens where the roles are not permitted to be fluid. And that's usually because they have to do with power. So the way, the way society regenerates power relationships requires that certain roles training that we get are not held as fluid, but are held as solid, as are held as um, what we are all of the time. So I won't go into be later talk about you know how this feels as a boy and what men do to boys and how that keeps happening. But but I think that's the that's the thing that we have to look at within a Buddhist context. So we're not just we're doing this particularly within a Soto Zen Buddhist environment where we're always looking at how we um, hold solid views of self and how that causes us suffering. In certain ways, this work is no different from any of the other work. It just has deeper, more profound, and often more terrifying implications. Because when we're going into looking at the self that's constructed by patriarchy, it's not as simple as, okay, um, this became a way I do things because my particular parent did this to me at a particular time in a particular set of relationships. This is the whole ocean. This is how we completely understand relating to one another. So what am I when that's gone? When am I when I don't when I can't hang my hat on what it is to be a male that is in a privileged dominating relationship to all other beings? You know, especially a white male in relation to all other beings. So um the unfortunate thing is we have to cut ourselves. Bell Hooks talks about this, that we trade in our, we trade in our humanity for privilege. And, um, and I think that's really what's at the heart of what we're trained as, as young boys, is that we're slowly trained in trading it bit by bit, pieces of our humanity, for the privilege that we get back for that trade. The trade is, ends up being a pretty terrible one in the end. Mm. And that, you know, that ends up in homicide, suicide, drug addiction, everything else. I mean, we can go on and on, but violence in so many forms, but it is the initial trade. Yeah, this, this sort of Faustian deal, if you will, with giving up our, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, giving up our real sense of possibility and connection and intimacy um, for, for this place of privilege. And yeah. it's kind of a bum deal in the end. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Joseph, you want to pick up there? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot that's just shared and said, and even thank you for sharing our, our little piece on our website about what our group is is about, in a sense, because um, it just reminds me of where we are in the group and the language that we use, and it was a, has been a long conversation of how do we title our group when is a good time to retitle our group based on what we're learning so for example even sacred masculine right? we've come to an understanding that even masculine or the feminine as words has us immediately thinking about the body and the binary in a particular way and it's not honoring the fluidity that greg is talking about mm -hmm. right? and these sacred energies are fluid in nature, when we really understand them innately and inherently, they have nothing to do with the conditioned language that we have placed upon them in terms of masculine and feminine. However, those are words that we use to allow us to enter into our conditioned framework and our inherited dominance, our inherited violence, um, and the intersectionality of it all. And you know, being a black male body, being a black Japanese male body, my relationship to so-called privilege is very different than it is with um, Greg's, for example. I actually don't feel that same type of so-called privilege being in a black male body, right, as a white male does. It's, it's very different than when we get into these conversations around um, 
male and female, right? What it means to be a man or a woman. We really have to recognize that culturally, it's very different for so many of us. And that in itself informs and impacts the way that we express dominance and patriarchy. Mm. And so me as a black man is very different. My expression of dominance and patriarchy is slightly different than it is for Greg, based on the way that I've been raised and based on what has been done to our culture for generations and generations and why we're even here at this point having this conversation. Mm. Right? And finding the commonalities and finding the uniqueness, but understanding that it's all held in this drive to dominate and to oppress and to limit who we are inherently yeah human beings on this earth and and what i love about your saying is and what's coming up for me is this idea of sort of fear and how you know sort of why would we be limiting right and why would we why would we trade why would we make that deal right Mm -hmm. it's been proven to kind of be a bad deal right for so many why, why do we continue to have this idea or this belief and cling to, to use the Buddhist, you know, sort of language of, of you know, craving or clinging as being one of the um, obfuscations, if you will, for, um, I guess, liberation, right? Moving freely, being freely, be co, mm, collectively in the soup together, as opposed to, I'm the carrot, you're the celery, stay away, you know, <laughs> like, you know, we're not, right? How do we, how do we kind of just like, you know, realize that we're, we're in the same pot, quite literally. Um, and, and, and how fear is sort of the thing that seems to keep on getting um, fed, um, like that, you know, wolf analogy of which one grows, the one that you feed, the, you know, the wolf that's, right. And where does that fit in, in terms of being embodied beings, men in your cases for this group, how does that get held and expanded? And then what sort of can be the possibility of, okay, so if I'm not going to be in this place of needing to dominate, needing to oppress, because there's a fear that if I don't, then I won't be in a position of privilege, which is the bargain that I've made. If I, if I let that go, right? One of the many things we let go in practice. If I let that go, then what, what am I opening up to? Is it just uncertainty? Is it just a mystery? Is it something greater that I couldn't have imagined? Do I have to see for myself? You know, I, I want to back up a little bit about the, on the, on the, on the trade, right? Because the, because it is true that there's this kind of, um, anxiety or fear around the trade-off of privilege but alongside of that is most of us not all of us but most of us have had patriarchy beaten into us and i'm not using that metaphorically you know there we there if we expressed emotion as young boys we were hit if we were um if we lived if we lived out what wasn't the prescribed male identity we were abused, humiliated, etc. So when one is up against that moment of how do I release, there is the there is the privilege, but the privilege is so deeply, and this is where I think the current conversation actually loses sight of some of the embodied realities of what's going on, is the giving up of that privilege isn't just the giving up of the privilege, it's deeply enmeshed with. I will die. Yeah. Like I will die. There's a three-year-old boy that will die in those men. And so to actually be able to live down into that child that whose life was threatened and who is acting in certain ways in order to preserve their own life. We all, I mean, until we until we're liberated, to use the language, until we're liberated from it, we're all carrying around traumatized children. Mm. greater or lesser degrees and until we can um, feel into that and for some of us our embodiment keeps the trauma going into our adulthood right so so that's um i think that's one piece of it uh and then there is the and then there is just the sheer fact that the only thing that feel that i'm used to the privilege 
and and the anxiety of giving up self or ego that comes with doing that. But I, I think that it's somehow we need to really look into how do we support that process together? How do we actually support people in um, men, in this case, in feeling into the terror of what it would be to not be in the world in the same way? Because you do trade off a lot. There's a lot that goes in the way you're treated in the world. We're, the men you can be around is much more limited. The men you want to be around becomes yeah. much more limited. You know, the world changes in dramatic ways. So that's a little bit that comes up when I think about the fear piece of it. I of the, yeah, no, I but. really appreciate that. And and I it just re reminds me, and then I'm going to give it to you, Jason, is that... Um, Oftentimes in 12 step, it'll be like that, right? You can't yeah. go back to the same bar or hang out with the same friends or do the same <laughs> things because you're going to be drinking and that's not what you want to be doing because you want to have a clear mind and you want to be more connected to yourself or others. So you are making then that new trade kind of based out of faith, really, that there will be yeah. something else on the other side, right? And that um, you use the, in that case of the analogy, alcohol or whatever compulsion that you were using to keep you going and survive something that was untenable previously. So we bow to that, recognize that it served its place or whatever it is and caused its own harms perhaps along the way. And then that's a process of letting go and unpacking and, you know, allowing to kind of dissolve, but then moving into this new place of connection, but realizing that you're going to have to change up. Um, it's going to change uh, who you experience, how you experience and what you experience. Yeah, and that's the power of community. You mentioned earlier, Sangha, the community, how we come together and do this work together. Because that, again, that fear that we're talking about, that, that, uh, that Greg mentioned, that you just mentioned, a lot of that fear is that we're alone. And we're not going to be seen, we're not going to be heard. But the more we are able to be aware of our own inheritance, inhabitants, or expression of it. Is there anyone else out there that feels this way? If I leave this group, am I going to then be a pariah back home? When I start speaking in a different way, when I start acting in a different way, am I gonna to have to be then forced to then... See, I'm feeling that right now. Mm. Body, right? The, the code switching that we have to do so many times. Mm -hmm. right? Communities in which we live in, the places that we grew up in that feel like home because it's with our family and the folks that we grew up with. But as we are growing and we are on our own separate paths, even though we're together moving, but we're all on our individual paths. And if there's one of us that then ends up going to Brooklyn Zen Center or another group, because they're seeing something or feeling something that just doesn't mesh right with uh, how they need to express a sense of love or to explore love or to explore self-care, whatever that may be, or just to be heard. Uh, they get to a point where they're saying to themselves, this, there's something that's just not right. Mm. And I'm in this group and I feel that something is just not right. And we're talking about it and I'm being challenged. And then I leave out of that space, I leave out of those doors, and I go right back into the world where I end up being and spending 95% of my life. And I have to live in that code switched location. So how do I then bring what I'm learning and feeling out into that space, out into that world? From the group out into that From the group out into that space. Yeah. yeah. So maybe an example from your own life um, of how that's happened, where you as a practitioner, uh, not even as a teacher, but as a practitioner, as a student, as you said, maybe where that's happened, where there was this piece where it was informed by the collective and by the community. Because what came up for me is like sort of this strong, silent type John Wayne embodiment of, you know, Eurocentric, you know, masculinity or individualized individuation or meritocracy not that we don't all make our own efforts toward whatever it is that we're dedicating ourselves toward right like we want to like nobody else is going to clean my apartment i need to do that right mm -hmm. um at the same time that 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 to have needs 
for men, it sounds like here, or to be in community might be, well, wait, I can't do this by myself. I should do this by myself, right? That that's also maybe an embedded um, sort of message in there. Um, and that part of what I think it was the language you used, Greg, to, you know, is like terrifying, you know, to, to kind of, you know, change or switch or, or move toward this. So I'm curious, Josanne, if you could give an example of, of what that was like for you when you were in community learning something, embodying this collective feeling of, you know, maybe juiciness around some new learning or experiential, that then you went back out into the world and were like, hmm, how do, how do I apply this? Yeah. <laughs> That the felt sense of it was actually very familiar to the felt sense of being able to walk the streets and walk the world in a black male body and understanding the freedom to just walk in this body without fear. Right? Without fear of being pulled over, harassed, shot, killed, whatever that may be, by just simply showing up in this body. So then there's this, within the group, it was a deeper, deeper understanding of, yes, I am in the male body, yet what does it actually mean to be a man in that sense? Right? And is it really being a man or is it being a human being that is tapped into the innate capacity, the innate givings that um, are true to me? So what is what is it that's true to me, Joe Zen, in this larger context of community. And that's love, that's liberation, that's uh, helping someone across the street. I'm a larger sized person, so understanding the size of me can be beneficial, right? I can carry certain things. There's a ability um, in my body that allows me to support people in that sense. So walking down the street and looking at someone and just smiling, for example, right? It can be something that's simple, but it's also just me showing up and feeling very secure in who I am. Right? Mm. The simple act of looking at someone and smiling or just looking at someone and seeing them for another human being. Right? And I'm saying it in this way because a lot of times we talk about how are we showing up in the world? Where do we go to work? What do we earn? We, we, we talk about these things in a material type of way. And for me, it was really about how am I showing up with people? How am I walking amongst people in this way? Am I looking at someone and is there judgment that's coming up? Can I not judge someone? Can I see someone as an extension of me. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, before we move on to maybe this um, other piece that you sort of talked about when you talked about the three-year-old, Greg, is there anything else you want to add to anything that's been offered so far? No, I was thinking when I was listening to you both talk, I was thinking that there's a process too that I, for me, that was affirming what was already there and what I already knew that wasn't affirmed by everything around me. Mm -hmm. So a shy, sensitive child that wanted to sit at a table of women and listen to them all the time, which was my tendency as a kid. You know, but that wasn't what was affirmed by the men around me. Mm -hmm. So so there's this, there's already this, we already are this multiplicity, we all already are this fluidity. And, and it gets killed off. We're born this. And it gets killed off by, by in this case, patriarchy. And then, and then what is it to remember back in and affirm something that humiliation taught you to hate? Wow. You know, and to get, and to actually feel back into that cycle and say, no, actually, those things that up until recently I hated myself for were when I was trying to be kind, when I was trying to be gentle when I was intuitively leaning into appropriate responses to a very tender living world. And um, that, was, that was not easy. <laughs> and it still happens. 
And and to your question about, or to your point about, um, one of the hardest things I think is this idea that you're supposed to be able to support everything, you know, and um, that takes a long time to mm. shed that, to shed that one. That's a hard one to shed. Mm. And, and it's something I've been aware of for a very long time. And it's still such a strong inclination. And so to I think support so, everything individually. Yeah. Individually. Yeah. Yeah. And to, and so I, what, what is really helpful is to, I mean, I think what's emerged in me, and this is another thing that is just remembering my childhood, because like someone you mentioned before, I forget who you mentioned, who went to the forest as a, as a way of um, saving himself from his, from what he was experiencing at home. That was my experience also. Nature. Yeah, nature. And so bringing oneself back to Mother Earth and really feeling, really taking seriously, I am going to go to the river. I recently went home for three days just to sit by the river I grew up next to because my family's been there for, for 14, 15 generations mm. along the Susquehanna. And so I just needed to sit there and learn. And, um, and I think that that's remembering. It's kind of remembering through the violence. Yeah. And bringing that back again. Yeah. That's that's so beautiful and bringing in the metaphor of the river, the intergenerational and ancestral wisdom mm -hmm. that's there, the remembering. Um, I always love that word in terms of, you know, sort of being right, like sati and coming back to, mm -hmm. you know, our wholeness, right? We're cutting off, right? The members are our, our, our embodiment. And then the remembering is that coalescing um, and really sort of it's already here, just got fragmented. I mean, if you use Dan Siegel's language, you know, you talk about, um, you know, yeah. the fragmentation and the dissociation. You can use the neuroscientific lens. You can use the, you know, DSM-5, you know, analyses, which I'm not a big fan of, but you could, you could explain this sense of um, being pulled apart um, in many different ways. And then the whole point is the integration, right? Sure. Or, the, or the cohesion, if not the integration, right? Some, some, which is then, I guess, sort of dissolving into the essence of all that is, of which we were always a part, of which we can do to what Josen said, finally just drop into and actually feel that and feel like, hey, it's okay to smile at this person because there's no <laughs> difference, there's no separation. And I still need to make sure that if I'm in a strange place, I make sure that I know that when I'm crossing the street, I'm mindful. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, so it's kind of the both and or the and and, yeah. um, I think. Yeah. There's this, even when I was talking about smiling at someone, there's an inherent conditioning for me to smile in order to take care of that person, mm. right? Instead of really just smiling because we're here together as human beings. Beautiful. And in terms of what Greg was saying, there's this, there's a deeper listening, what you just mentioned, Francesca, there's a deeper listening from the body that's happening. It's a, it's a listening to deeply understand, not to respond, not to react, not to fix, but to really understand and come from that place of understanding, as Greg was saying, the appropriate response from there. Yeah, the beingness. Yeah, the, yeah, being. the beingness. Yeah, yes. I love that. Okay, um, so let's just kind of, as we are going through this conversation, maybe revisit this idea of the, um, you know, I'm pra trauma practitioner and 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 uh, trauma healing practitioner <laughs> although i've been a trauma practitioner <laughs> i practice trauma really well um, so, um but that uh boys being cut off from you know the ways in the ways that were raised you alluded to it you know the three-year-old inside and how much of that inner child work and recovery you know how much can that be done in community in group in you know meditation settings um, you know, maybe through psychotherapy or not, depending on who you're working with or other kinds of um, healers um, and the ways in which, um, you know, if we can get there, even if it's a little terrifying, if we can kind of get there to be with that younger self, um, how that can be a portal to being more fully present and, and able to connect with other people now. This is connected to... Um... Mm, the multi-lineages that we connect with, right, and what we bring together within our practice. There's a training that I went through 
couple of years ago, indigenous focusing oriented therapy training. Which yeah. And completely powerful for me. And I'm in that one too, so I, I feel you. Yes, yes. And it's it's dharmic in nature, right? It's really understanding the the threat of dharma within all this these teachings and our connection with the elements and with the earth. And it one thing in particular to your question, it lets us reconnect with the inner child, whatever that child may be, whatever age they may be. And it's reminding us of something that's happening in the present. In particular, what sometimes what that child may be reminding us is that we have survived this. We are here right now, coming forward for you right now, however old you may be, maybe 20, 30, 40, 70, 80. That inner child that is coming forward is reminding us we have survived this. What were the tools, what were the medicines that we did to survive this? And we are powerful. We are love. I'm here to remind you that you are love in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we identify as the trauma as being us. And if we can under we can reshape that, reclaim our innate love. That's been that right there has been completely I no, I shouldn't say completely healing because I'm I'm still going through that. But even that piece, our teachers would say in, in that training that we are healed, but we have been blocked from that understanding of healing. Right? That there is a healing that's already there. So what's blocking that healing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah beautiful. I love that. And 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 yes, it goes back to the remembering piece. Yes. Um, so that, that, that little inner three-year-old that was humiliated, Greg, to your point, mm -hmm. Um, you know, really sort of finding a way to um, heal him or let him know that that he made it. Mm -hmm. Now, listening to Zen, I was thinking about Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, you know, this very, mm -hmm. the same idea of we're already liberated. We just don't know it. We just don't know it. And um, when I was listening to your question about... Um, where do we go? The, what came up was all of it. We have to do all of those things, you know, in a certain way, whatever comes to us is the thing that's calling us. That's what we need to do. So for some reasons, for some people, it will be very much a kind of familial individual psychotherapeutic model. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't think I can do it alone because I think it's too rooted in the individual in ways that are confusing to us as beings. So there's, you know, there's, there's that piece of it, but, 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 my wife Laura is also in IFOT, so we have a we have a circle here. Mm -hmm. um, Yay, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that way of what it brings up for me, and Josen and I talk about this a lot about uh, about living from ancestral mind. Or I would I like to use the I, I really like in the in the Chinese and the Japanese that the word Shin is both mind and heart as one thing, mm -hmm. and. Um, and so when I say ancestral mind, I'm using it in that way, where it's also ancestral heart. But um, one thing that is really, that has been interesting and powerful for me as an experience is that when I am clearly seated in, a, in an ancestral mind, and I mean the sense that whatever, what's coming forward is multi-generational. I'm not identified with this little being that's going around trying to do things in a city that's very hard to do things in and all of that but there's i feel ancestors with me i feel mother earth with me i feel the future of generations toxic masculinity cannot survive that it just can't survive it there's no place for it it doesn't make a lick of sense in that space so I think, you know, I think as we begin to realize that in a deep way, in a heartfelt way, which I hope is where we're going. As a, I mean, there's clearly this very strong um, arising of toxic masculinity that we're seeing right now in positions of power and so on. But I'm, I'm really praying it's the, it's the death gasp <laughs> and that because we're going in another direction. Mm-hmm. And um, 
but I do, I do feel as we connect more and more, and we have to to survive, right? The eco, what's happening with Mother Earth and happening to human species, we either wake up from this or we're done. Right. But there's not a solution. There's no other solution anymore so to, to, to ending patriarchy. I mean, I just don't see that there's another path. Right. It becomes not so much like we need to end patriarchy because it's the right thing to do. It's like, no, it's actually the only solution for sustainable <laughs> yeah. something that we're, you know, sorry, we're not just going to all live on Mars. It doesn't work. Well, you know, I mean, there may be beings out there, but yeah, we don't. Yeah. We'll, we'll dominate another planet. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, and, and so, right. And so we're holding that, right. Like, and I think that's so beautiful. It's like, we have this body, we have this planet, we have this solar system, we have this galaxy, we have this universe but who knows what else is out there and so are we what not just this you know stardust and all that stuff at a one level and then are we not just all of that that has been also embodied in this nervous system that walks around and gets conditioned and gets programmed and can reprogram and remember and as you say come back to what's already here and never was gone at all anyway um, and so maybe on that point, switching to the, or shifting, I should say, to the piece about the internalized patriarchy and then moving forward to the uh, relational aspects of um, embodied females and, and sort of how embodied males interact with embodied females. But So the internalized piece and then the other piece, either way, whoever wants to maybe take on either of those. You know, the first time I met Greg, I walked into Brooklyn Zen Center and I knew of Greg. Greg knew of me. And I walked in. I was the only. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is where I'm going with that. Because uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure, right? I was going in with, this, with a very protective piece of me that on one end it was honoring and it's just what I learned to protect myself. And on the other end, it was me embodying and even expressing a form of toxic, toxicity that wasn't allowing for me to meet palm to palm, heart to heart. And I went up to Greg and I said, hello. And before even Greg said hello, he said, thank you for being here. I know what, ha what it has taken for you to get here. Mm. I almost dropped to the floor and just started Balling at that point. Well, it's giving me tears now. That's how we met at Brooklyn Zen Center. Beautiful. And so we're talking about the expression of all these energies, the, the, the nurturing energy, the feminine nurturing energy. That's how Greg met me. There was no competition. There was no toxicity. There was only but love acknowledgement, seeing, and an honoring of the history and honoring of even my own ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Would that we were all greeted that way and uh -huh. could meet ourselves that way. Yes. Yeah. Could meet one another that way. Yes. And beautiful that you had that awareness or maybe it was just awareness, not awareness you had, but awareness reaching out, Craig, from you to Josanne. Yeah, I remember that moment. And um, I remember Josanne coming in and um, he felt totally trustworthy. Mm. So, and not everyone does, you know, most people don't. <laughs> mm. so, so, so it was... Um, it was that, and I think, you know, one thing, this is the, we can call this, mas I, I, I agree with Jazen's earlier statement about being careful of masculine and feminine, even as, as identifiers, but one thing I noticed, and this is, this is my experience with Jazen that I just love so deeply, is um, one thing that happens when men start doing this work is they become more neurotic than they were before because now they're starting to just hate themselves as men and and get and and they become kind of one thing that can happen is is they become kind of a curled up nervous apologetic being mm. and um 
and the groundedness that's possible by giving up all of that chatter that patriarchy has and misogyny has that that we've internalized from that training giving that up there's a ground that emerges you know and just a real rootedness that isn't that curled up nervous self-loathing being enacted and um and that's what i appreciate about um Chosen's expression in the world is that it there's both gentleness and this very upright strong presence that isn't apologizing mm. and i think you know and i feel that um that's where we all need to be going <laughs> you know we all need to whatever the whatever the body is you know loving gentle connection no apology for who i am i had nothing to do with it anyway mhm you know none of us chose so we did not choose the bodies we were born into or the places we come from mhm some buddhists would disagree with me on that some <laughs> hindus when some hindus would disagree with me on that but let's just say we didn't you know and to live out that unapologetic gentleness i think is um such a deep gift you know jozen does that for our whole community and and um stronger because of it beautiful i'm definitely stronger because of it <laughs> no question to be able to live in that place and to embody it and to meet folks and to be in conversation in terms of what our respective capacities are to embody that to embody that unapologetic being and what is our expression of it i love to think of the expression of it as being artistic in some way mhm and within our within our community you know we have folks who are cooks right? we have folks who are sewers who are artists musicians writers orators whatever that may be and providing space for all of us to express this that just that what everything that we're talking about through creativity and through their origins mhm yeah beautiful yeah that real sense of of possibility and creation and and um generative um you know yes. uh beauty really um as a path to to reconnection and to healing and um yeah i really i really appreciate that and so as we begin to sort of wind down this conversation although i'd love to continue it i know we don't have forever um in this moment anyway um how do we move away then if we're sort of you know the tendency in a male body might be okay well now i'm waking now i'm feeling really neurotic and apologetic and bad okay i'm not going to necessarily want to get stuck there that's terrifying i don't want to go back to this like privileged thing where i'm you know oppressing at the same time um feeling a little unmoored so i know community is here to support me so that's good and my creative arts and my places of you know creating bounty are there too but how do i show up now relationally with women now that it's me too now that we're in this era where whatever like how do or you know what do i do how do i do this you know the one thing that um comes to mind is and i think this really takes this takes a kind of imaginative discipline if it's been trained out of you and and that is to really do the work of and you'll never fully understand but really do the work of trying to understand what it is to be in this world as a woman and 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 uh, and to see what it is to walk down a street being hurt to just know the violence that is non-stop the discouragement the undermining of one's confidence just all of the things that are going on and um be present for that healing i mean we can say the easy things like don't talk this way and don't talk that and sure we should there are the don'ts right and and there are plenty of don'ts and we shouldn't do them <laughs> so but um don't do them yeah don't, <laughs> don't do, do them the, you know don't, do the don't. don't condescend don't treat yeah. don't treat female bodied people as if they're lesser beings all of those kinds of things that we should do but i think the actual for me the experience that is more healing is to really show up 
deeply underneath lifting the ribs of women and support them in being human beings in a world that want to constantly, a world that constantly dehumanizes women. Like to be that support. And I don't, and it, it's not prescriptive in the sense of this is the situation, always do this. I don't think it's that simple. I think it goes back to what Jason was talking about of, of, of including a sense of body and connection and understanding what it is in a given moment and really attending, which means that we have to build skill sets we might not have, relational skill sets that we might not have. And, and what you said earlier, Francesca, about um, relating to oneself. If we're in deep relationship to ourselves as beings, then we can be in deep relation. We slowly begin to be in deep relationship with others. But um, especially if we become, if we're in relationship with what is traditionally considered feminine, and we start to really raise that up as something that is um, worthwhile mm. and important and necessary. And then we're not so afraid of it in other people and we're not so alienated from it. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. I have many more thoughts on that, but I'll stop. <laughs> well, I mean, we can, let's go to just end it and maybe we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, it, it also informs the way that we show up for every human being. Trans women, trans men, gender not conforming. Whatever body that you're in, how do we show up? That way, if we are inheriting a, a male dominance, that male dominance, that men identify dominance has dominated all beings, and in particular the earth. And one thing that has been important for me to understand is not to expect someone to allow me in when I want them to allow me in. Mm. And to really tap into that, that craving, which is another form of dominance, right? Trying to force my so-called awokeness or enlightenment <laughs> onto someone, mm -hmm. right? Do you hear what I'm saying to you? I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. I'm apologizing to you. I'm apologizing for my man that's not listening to me. Ah. No. Again, it's going back to this place of listening and and appropriately responding from the body and meeting people where they are and we're not always going to meet at the, in the same time that's appropriate for each other so understanding what that is well and I'll, I'll say this on the flip side for someone to create some space for another to be redeemed essentially because if we are actually doing this work and if we ourselves have been harmed, can we meet someone and say, thank you for the work that you have been doing? Mm. And no, I'm not ready to engage with you on this level just yet. Or yes, I'm ready to engage with you. Let's talk about how that can be. But if we're doing that level of work that Greg is talking about, that we're all talking about, at some point, all that work is for us to be in community with one another. Mm hmm Right to therefore be in community with the earth and all the elements in that way. So we're doing this all for each other on behalf of all beings. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, for for any listeners who are sort of looking for some pithy 12-step program to like be nice to ladies, uh -huh. I don't know that that's what this podcast was about, right? Like, so it's just, and, and, I, and I guess I appreciate that because there's probably plenty of those out there. And um, I don't think that that was what we needed to be doing here today because I think that underneath those layers, which I think are um, necessary in so far as that, um, you know, you need a bumper on your car, but you need an engine first. Um, and... Uh, that that is kind of what this is about, I think. You know, what's the driver? How do we get underneath the hood? And, um, and really sort of, you know, tinker with what's, what's in there so that we can run smoothly again. Yeah, be safe on the road. Yeah.
you know, Jazen and I were recently kind of um, laughing about the instinct toward creating rules, mm. and um, and that when things get really difficult, people just want to throw rules at them or twelve or steps at them or whatever it is, and um, and it's not that it's not that those things are not useful, but but I think we have to be really really careful because the mind of of domination seeps in and then thinks, okay, I'm going to learn those things. And now I have it. And now I'm going to bludgeon the world with my new feminist anti-patriarchal <laughs> wisdom. Yeah. You know, and, um, and we've all seen this in, in many ways. You know? So, so it's, um, yeah, it's funny. We're in a very capitalist, commodifying world where everything gets turned into step stages and rules and regulations and then the body and the mind and the heart doesn't really change we just create new avenues for the same systems of domination to re re-manifest in ways that now know how to talk the talk in a different way it's much it's so much slower and so much deeper and so much scarier and so much more confusing, confusing, and we don't have any idea. One of the most powerful groups I've been in that are really working hard to embody what we're talking about. And you may be familiar as the GRIP program, Guiding Rage into Power program at San Quentin. And this is a program that is designed for folks who are doing 20 to life and to really understand the crimes that they committed, to understand the causes and conditionings that they embodied up to that point of the crime, to apologize, but they're apologizing in a way that they're not expecting anyone to receive the apology at all. And they're doing it in community. And it's this, this question of, if I get out, if I go back out into the world, how am I going to show up? What have I learned by the crime that I committed in that time that I have committed? What is all of that? And they're doing it in community and being very, very vulnerable with one another. Mm. Beautiful. And it's, yeah, it is beautiful. Mm. It really is. Well, I, you know, and that just reminds me, it's like we're all on our path. We're all on a path. It's a question of whether or not we're aware that we're on a path or that we have any intentionality around being on a yeah. path or whether or not we are just sort of like being passed onto or whether or not we are walking, you know, with some level of, of awareness. Even if, again, we're just sort of setting the compass, even though we don't have some, you know, fixed destination GPS here where we're locked in, you know, for good, but that we're sort of, um, orienting toward that which, um, if nothing else, is possibility, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, prediction, um, mm -hmm. and really being more okay with what that means. Because as you're saying committed, I'm like, well, yeah, they're committed, but they're committed. And what are we committed to? Mm -hmm. And can we make a new commitment to something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, gentlemen, is there anything else you'd like to share about what we've discussed, about the Brooklyn Zen Center and your particular offering, any other offerings that you may have, like you just said, about the GRIP program that you feel are places that um, not be in directly your purview, but things that you feel other people might want to know about? Um, anything else? I'll just say something if there is, if there happens to be a man who hears this, listens to this and is scared to death or teetering on whether they want to do this work or whatever. Um, what is on the other side is deep, is the deep connection of one's birthright as a human being in the world. And there is no, there is just no amount of power. There is no amount of privilege or domination. There's just nothing that will ever substitute for that. And, and the, um, 
the gift of being able to be with everyone who comes in the room as a human being, everyone. And that they can be with you as a human being without the bullshit of our histories of violence constantly unconsciously intervening they'll be there but we can be intimate and loving with them too and that can be the gateway of our connection too also it doesn't have to be the division all the time and um, i just hope i would just encourage people to move beyond that terror to what's on the other side because in the end cliche or not it's all going to be love that's the only thing that's going to save this species uh, is just it. Beautiful. I think your your puppy concurs. <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> here, here, says the pup. And Justin, anything to add for you as we close? I completely agree. Nothing more to add there. The only thing is we are putting pulling together a, a resource list of what has supported us as a group at Broken Event Center. And that will be on our website shortly within the next couple of weeks. And those are good guiding points for anyone who has been doing this work for some time or completely new to this work. Yeah, these sources are very important. They sure are. And I will share this with, um, with folks and, and really just uh, a lot of gratitude for your practice, your intention, your embodiment, your willingness to share and express. And um, I don't know, just to kind of show, if nothing else, that, hey, there's some of us out here doing this. And um, if you didn't know, or that this is an option, or that, you know, this might be a way, um, that uh, there's a lot of food out there, and this is also on the buffet, and maybe you want to try it. So appreciate your your offering and your invitation to to do that uh, it's deep work and and i do think in many ways um however many people are able to engage locally in brooklyn in your particular sangha um, perhaps by sharing this it plants a seed for other people to perhaps uh, consider and invite what might be uh, a way that they could uh, do some of this in their own communities that's right Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much. Take good All care right. and be well. You too.